is important to them. It's so how do you feel about the, you know a character or a rod or sketching it? You know, because we can't know for sure, uh, or you know, then birth is the is the dividing line or viability, uh, which has changed even in the past. You know, in the years since Roe versus Wade, uh, viability has moved backwards uh, or closer. There have been tremendous, there's been tremendous progress in terms of viability. Children that were born you know, 10 weeks premature uh, a few years ago wouldn't make it now, it has been pushed back uh, quite a bit. But I just worry about the way we talk about these issues because when we're, what we're talking about is that someone has worth only if they have a certain utility or someone has worth only if they have a certain brain function. I think that can take us to a very dangerous place and has throughout history. Uh, when you decide that certain people have worth and certain people don't, or you define sort of arbitrarily, well, those are people, those aren't people, we can do whatever we want with those people, we can't do it with those. But are we, very but, dark places. I mean, just to play stop the devil's advocate, but we're always doing that, right? Because we don't mourn the spontaneous abortions and yeah. fertilized eggs. Well, that, that's, I mean, you, you mourn the death of your grandpa who's 92 in a very different way than you do a keeping shot through the heart. That's, that doesn't mean that those people have different moral worth. It just means that you know some things are natural, some things aren't. I mean, yes, um, naturally some some people miscarry. This happens very common for a lot of women. It's different than like going in and like tearing something apart one by limb. I mean, that's just it's very different. But I wonder what you, what do you mean when you say we right? Like this is the you know what should mean we can look This is this is my concern here. Is uh, you know there is certainly uh, a completely legitimate and rich debate among philosophers and, uh, you know, at bars and sort of the cultural side of the debate, um, which I think is very related to another phenomenon that um, libertarians are, are keen on or should be keen on, which is uh, the notion of the expanding circle, right? That we are, um, you know, one of the great triumphs of libertarianism, you know, writ large across history is that we treat more and more people like people. Um, and or like we treat ourselves. Or like we treat, right, that we treat more and more people like um, one of us rather than others, right? And, um, you know, that, that this, this argument goes all kinds of places, including uh, the abolition of slavery and the fact that I'm just talking about the use of force. I'm saying we feel differently about the use of force but to end someone's life than we do about The phrase, force. we feel differently, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, the other problem is you're saying there is someone. That's the, that's what I think is a dispute. You it, merely because I would argue because it's a fertilized egg that is not necessarily someone. You have to show that to me, and I don't know what kind of evidence you would be able to come up with that would in fact be able to persuade me. And I'm not sure what evidence I could provide you that would get you on my side of the debate either. I, I don't know the answer to that kind of question. So, Rob, can I ask a question? Because uh, one of the things that I wanted to look into is what's the role of science or religion or philosophy in deciding these? Because on a certain level, we can talk about the biology of things and you know what's going on, but then it's it's not really clear that science or religion or philosophy or ethics will actually give us the moral answers that we want. So if you can't say here's evidence that shows this is a person and you can't be you know you can't be persuaded, what, what do you use to go? What I mean, where are you coming up with? You, you do the best you can with the information that you have. Provided to yourself. I mean, you you look at all the questions that are, are related to personhood. What happens to eighty percent of, of fertilized eggs that has some relevance? I think it has some relevance to it. Or those are not persons. Or you think about a, a, a thought. Here's a thought experiment. You you have a three year old boy and and ten seven day old embryos in, in in a laboratory that's catching on fire. You can only say one. Which one do you say? The three year old or the ten seven seven day old embryos? How long did it take to get the light bulb? Exactly. But the, my point is that you that you have everybody has different to intu intuitions about this particular issue. I think, and and you try to do the best you can. You struggle with it, and you also try to think about what it is that you're trying to impose on women as well. You're trying to think, well, do you want to force uh, women to have children that they don't want? And so it's a it's a whole panoply of things that comes to what you can what you yourself can do. In the, in the honesty of your own heart. Uh, just, just very quickly to pick up on that, because uh, then we'll uh, go on to a couple other things. One of the things that's interesting is that even a lot of very staunch opponents of abortion will say, okay, you know, no abortions except in the case of the life to preserve the life of the mother, uh, which is a kind of long-standing medical precept that if you can save one life, that's better than losing two. And we could argue that, but then they'll also say, and in the case of rape and incest, uh, Mississippi in researching this. Uh, interestingly, the only uh, cause before Roe versus Wade that Mississippi allowed 
abortion for was incest, not rape, but incest. And it's kind of like if you're the Mississippi Tourist Board, uh, you know, you would probably want to rethink that and come up with more, you know, if, if, you know why would incest be the only thing that would uh, legitimate it? But can we all agree on some level that, yeah, that's, 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 that's it. Uh, but, um, but, you know, that these carving out exceptions for things like rape and incest, possibly with the life of the mother, uh, you know, seem kind of strange because it's like, you know, the argument against rape is that, well, a woman didn't consent to become pregnant or have this child. But then it's like, okay, so to, you know, to make it all right, we're going to kill the kid. I actually don't think it's weird. I mean, I think that's how we make all of our moral decisions. I mean, there's, there's, everybody has the, the incredibly complex and individualized preferences. And um, when you talk to, you know, individual women about why they have abortions, everyone has a different reason. Everyone has a different um, you know, series of things that they valued in a different order. And, and I guess I think um, the weird part is why have we empowered state legislatures or courts to say these three things are good reasons, these 37 things are bad reasons. And it doesn't strike me as weird that we would have a long list of reasons and want to accept some. Very quickly, by the way, they, according to a survey data, the top two reasons that might have been site for getting an abortion one is that they want 26% said they want to postpone childbirth, and 21% and, uh, and say it's not because they don't have the money or the means to uh, take care of the child. Run, we're going to... Well, no, what is, what, historically, one of the fascinating things is, uh, is abortion in the United States was not illegal until the 1830s at all. Every state was legal, and uh, there was no prohibition whatsoever against it. And why did we get the prohibition? It wasn't the Catholic Church or anything like that. It was the American Medical Association. It was a bunch of, of, of basically white Protestant guys who wanted to take away midwifery and take over the uh, obstetrics on their hand. And they were also very concerned, and you can go back and reread the history of all of this, they were very concerned because the Irish Catholics were having too many babies and the white Protestant women weren't. Therefore, we were going to force the white Protestant women to have babies and by outlawing abortion. And that's just historically the fact. And by by essentially the, 18, the late 1860s, it was illegal in every state. That gets into the whole crazy progressive and eugenics past of the general abortion movement. But I just want to say, one thing that really concerns me about the way we're talking about this. I'm sorry, how does that get into progressive? Well, this, say, was, this was the American Medical Association of 1840. No, at the, at the, at looking back into 100 years ago and whatnot, there was a yes. lot of uh, eugenics motivation for uh, abortion and our general culture there. Or, or I'm, certainly eugenics started to factor into discussions of control of reproduction. Right. But what I'm concerned about is how we're talking about an entire class of people and deciding that they're not people, and we're sort of making this arbitrary and saying, oh, well, why should why should we say that women can or can't do this? But we're forgetting to talk about the people that are involved, the, the human beings that are uh, that are killed because we think that we should not have any say in how and what women are doing. Um, it's not just a, a function. Uh, there are competing rights in play, and I think that we uh, it's important to talk about all the parties involved when we are talking about ending human life in the world. And, um, you know, on that, if people could quickly comment on what's the role of the, uh, of the father in this? Because there's the rights of the mother, competing rights, the rights of the mother, the rights of the fetus or child, and then there's the father. Um, do they have any role to play? Ron, you seem to be uh, staking out the most feminist position, self-consciously feminist position, so let's start with you. Uh, I actually think that they probably have no role in deciding that. Uh, I, I would hope that uh, couples who come to this decision to talk about it, but uh, ultimately it is really going to have to be on this decision because it is her body and it, it, what is happening to her is happening to her. I mean, there's a great deal of illogic on that part too, though. When you talk about if this child does somehow escape the birth canal, then we have the fathers being completely responsible for them, but they have no say whether they make it out of the birth canal, um, but they, we do punish them if they procure an abortion for their for the woman that they impregnated, particularly against her will. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of illogic in the, in the legal structure here. And again, I would, I, agree with you. I would just take the position that, yes, there is a lot of illogic in the legal structure, all the more reason to strip down the legal structure to remove this from the business of the law I and make it the business of individuals. And, and I think you're right to say that, um, you know, many, many people, or I think most 